So I was watching The Matrix Reloaded in the background. What a mistake. Yeah. And the opening scene where Trinity is running from an agent, and it turns out it's Neo's dream of the future, and the catalyst for him to beg her not to go, she jumps out the window, and as she's falling, she gets shot by the agent, and it's this whole dramatic thing, because she's going to die. But my question, which I've never had before, was what was her plan before that? She was still falling backwards out of the 60th story of this huge building heading towards the street. The movie makes it out like her getting shot is the tragedy, but she would have slammed down into the ground regardless. <laughs> the bullet is just pouring salt into the wound. That's a good point. So I've come to the conclusion that that movie might not make 100% sense. <laughs> That's a perfect example of why I don't like those movies. It feels like a lot of things are in there just to kind of be cool, but if you think about it, they don't really make sense. I think that is 100% true for the second one and the third one. I think the first one had much more thought put into it. I think that's true, but I still have some of the same problems. I'm not surprised. <laughs> but I am glad that the Wachowskis, it feels like they fully realized what they wanted to do in those movies even though you know the second and third one are completely ridiculous and do just feel like a bunch of random cool ideas but they feel like they're presented exactly the way they wanted to present them that's true because i was thinking about the way the slow motion reminds me of like a Zack snyder movie or something but Zack snyder movies feel a lot more just kind of thrown together and the matrix feels a lot more intentional all three of them yeah for sure. Just misguided, maybe. And lacking as much depth as they actually think they have. Yeah. Which is also true for Zack Snyder movies. Yeah. So, what did you check out this month? Well, speaking of Zack Snyder, I watched something that was tangential to his DC stuff, which was Suicide Squad, the first one. Oh, I just talked about this. Yeah, a few months ago. I had tried to watch this a long time ago. I think I had like an HBO trial or something that ran out before I could finish it. I've never heard anybody say anything good about this movie at all. Are you about to say something good about this movie? I, I, I knew you were going to ask that. It depends on your definition of good. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm really looking forward to what you're going to say right now. I didn't think it deserved its reputation of being as bad as everybody says it is. I didn't think it was good. Let's get that out of the way. It was not a good movie. But I didn't think it was that bad. I wasn't offended like I was with something like Batman v Superman or Man of Steel. It definitely had some problems, but I thought it was mostly just kind of a movie that didn't work, as opposed to a movie that failed horribly. I think one of the biggest problems is that half of the characters come in halfway through the movie, and then there's no time to do anything with them. And going with that, there are way too many characters in the movie, so there's not enough time to spend to develop most of them. And that means that most of them end up not doing anything. They tried to do Deadshot and El Diablo as kind of more developed characters, and that was okay. I think the problem with Deadshot is that you don't really get his internal perspective. It's more just him reacting to everybody else. And El Diablo's problem, I think, is that he's kind of in the background too much. Harley Quinn. We talked about how she doesn't make sense in this context. And I don't remember if I said that I don't like the modern version of Harley Quinn. I prefer the original cartoon version where she was actually interesting. Now it feels like they just try to make her hot and like trashy and skanky and that's her character and that's not interesting. The whole thing with her and the Joker, I wasn't expecting the Joker to be such a big part of the movie and I'll just say straight up I hated this version of the Joker. I can't stand Jared Leto in general. I don't think he's a good actor and this version did nothing for me. But a big question I had was, what is the relationship between Harley Quinn and the Joker in this version? I, I couldn't tell. And reading up on the movie and what the director wanted to do compared to what DC wanted to do, it sounds like that was one of the things that would have been a lot different and more defined originally. But in this version, it feels like the Joker just kind of pops in because they want to stick the Joker in there. And it doesn't actually matter. Yeah, I think I described it as a big plot leech. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it doesn't help that the main kind of threat or the, the I guess the main storyline is trying to stop this witch and her brother or whatever, which are two ambiguous 
too kind of insubstantial of characters to merit having this team go after them. It doesn't seem like a match for these characters to be dealing with a threat like that. And that's especially apparent when you get to the end and they're fighting and this witch can teleport people and do all kinds of stuff, all kinds of magic stuff. But during the fight for like two minutes straight, all she does is keep tripping people. Like, what is Harley Quinn going to do to a witch like that? What are any of these characters going to do? And most of them don't do anything. Killer Croc is in there for no reason. He doesn't do anything. Captain Boomerang, when they bring him in, they say it's kind of like his claim to fame or whatever is that he survived an encounter with a metahuman or whatever they call him. But it, he, he survived an, an encounter with the Flash, a character that's not exactly tr like murdering people or anything. And they don't establish him as having any skills, even throwing the boomerangs. He, he gets captured very easily and doesn't do anything. So he's just some guy that's there. Like, I know who he is because I know the comics, but in the movie, he's just some guy. And then toward the end of the movie, he has some kind of high-tech boomerang that he's using to spy on people or something, and it comes out of nowhere and doesn't, doesn't feel like it makes any sense in the context of this movie. So that was weird and definitely a mistake from a creative standpoint. Uh, sticking freaking Katana in there, like, again, I know her thing with her sword and stuff from the comics of stealing people's souls or whatever, but in the movie, they just kind of casually mention it, and you're just supposed to go along with it, and it doesn't matter at all, and she doesn't do anything, and then the movie's over. So there are other characters that I'm not going to mention that it's the same thing, they shouldn't be there, none of it matters. And I remember when the trailers were coming out for this movie, it was around the same time that the first Guardians of the Galaxy came out, and you could see... DC saying, oh shit, that movie is successful. Maybe we should try to do that. And each next trailer, people would point out on the internet how each next trailer would be a lot more colorful and try to play up the humor a lot more. And apparently that was a thing that was going on behind the scenes was trying to make the movie more comedic when it really isn't. And it, it makes the whole tone of everything just feel weird and not quite right. But I didn't think it was awful. I thought it mostly just kind of fell short and didn't really succeed as opposed to being really, really bad. I think it was misguided. I think even if the director had had his chance to do the movie the way he wanted, I think it probably would have been better and made more sense and felt more consistent. But I think it still wouldn't have been especially effective from a plot standpoint and from a character standpoint. But it feels like it wanted to be. Especially the way it starts out with introducing the characters and stuff. I thought that I thought it was a good way to start the movie, but then you don't really get a lot for most of the characters from there on. And again, going with the Guardians of the Galaxy thing, it makes sense that they got James Gunn to do the second one then. So I don't know. It wasn't good, but everybody on the internet talks about it like it's the worst movie ever, and I didn't think it was that bad. Interesting. If you want my take, you can watch, I think it was December, I talked about it. Yeah, I think so. And I don't agree with a lot of what you said. <laughs> Again, what a surprise. The only other thing I've had time for here, because I've been looking for streaming services, free streaming services in Japan, and there are basically none. There are some, but they're all in Japanese. My Japanese is not good enough to understand a lot of stuff without subtitles to the extent that I feel like I'm really enjoying watching something. But Netflix does still work. If you have an American Netflix account, it does work over here. So I watched Gamera Rebirth which was the Netflix original Gamera anime from 2023. It's only six episodes, and it's from some of the same people that did the Godzilla Planet of Monsters anime trilogy. I think that's what it was called, which was another original Netflix anime thing. They are both CG. They both do the bad fake frame skipping stuff that I've complained about before, where they try to make it look like traditional animation by purposely skipping frames, which is just distracting and looks bad. That Godzilla anime, all three of those movies were really boring, and it felt like the contents of one movie dragged out to three. I think I've talked about it a little bit before. I did not enjoy it at all. So I was very surprised when I started this one to find that I was enjoying it, at least at first. Each episode is about 45 minutes long, which turns out to really work, because each one is kind of like a mini-movie, where you get some monster that shows up, and you get your characters, which you're following a group of elementary school kids that, for some reason, keep having these encounters with these monsters, and Gamera keeps showing up, and he seems to have a connection to one of the kids of some kind, and keeps protecting them from these monsters. So each episode is a different monster, or a different type of monster. Some of them have multiple of the same monster, 
And while all that's going on, the government, there are some government agents that know something about what's going on. And they're trying to help the kids or something and trying to stop the monsters or whatever. So each episode, you get a little bit of advancement of the main storyline. You get the next monster that they have to deal with. And then usually toward the end of the episode, Gamera will show up to fight the monster. So it, it mostly works very well because you get a little bit of everything in every episode. And each episode is structured in a way that it feels like you have your beginning, your middle, and your climax fight at the end. As with a lot of modern anime, in my opinion... The intro and outro to this show are terrible and do not match the tone or feel or look or anything of the show. It just doesn't make sense. The contents doesn't match anything. The thing that made me not like it as much as it went on is the entire show is essentially a mystery where you want to find out what these monsters are, why they keep attacking these kids, you know, what what's going on, why is all this happening in the first place. And episode five turns out to be the big exposition dump episode. And the explanation for everything that's happening was so dumb. And you get kind of a, a main villain that turns up in episode five that was incredibly lame. It made me lose so much interest. It reminded me of so many other anime shows that will be entertaining as they're going along. I think of like a lot of comedic ones, uh, like comedic action ones, um, like Garen Lagan or Kill la Kill where I'm enjoying them as they're going along, they're enjoyable episodes, but then you get toward the end and it gets very plot-focused, and the plot is not really why you're watching the show, and it takes away a lot of the enjoyment for me, and I just kind of start zoning out. Um, that's kind of what happened here. Uh, it's not it, This is not a comedic show, but it made me lose a lot of interest when you had all your explanations, and they turn out to be so dumb. Thankfully, it does get better after that. The last episode kind of Puts it back on track a little bit, but it doesn't completely recover. The explanation for things I thought was really dumb. It does end in a way where clearly there is more. Yeah, it definitely seems like they're going to do another season. And I would be interested to see another season because the stuff that worked did work. There was some good stuff in here. In particular, you can tell they put a lot of focus on the monsters in terms of what they look like and how they're animated and how the fights play out. That all mostly works really well. And all of the monsters are actually monsters from the Showa movies. So I guess depending on how you look at it, there's like one new monster maybe. But they bring back all of the old monsters except one. And of course, it's Barugon, who I talked about before as being my favorite Gamera monster. Of course, that's the one they didn't stick in here. But I, I thought they did a good job with the redesigns and kind of updating everything and making them uh, feel like, for the most part, like threats that you really have to wonder how Gamera is going to win. And as is traditional for pretty much every Gamera thing, Gamera gets absolutely destroyed. He loses limbs, he gets impaled, he gets stuff shoved down his throat, all kinds of weird stuff happens. And I don't know, it must be in his contract or something, because that happens in every Gamera movie. And I actually thought one of the weaknesses was that the way each episode focuses on a different monster, Gamera himself ends up not getting as much development as he should have. He's just kind of there for most of it. And that was disappointing. It was okay overall. There's definitely stuff to enjoy. It was by far the best Godzilla, Gamera, Ultraman related anime that I've seen. Any Anything kaiju related like that. I haven't seen the Pacific Rim one that, uh, that Netflix also did, which is also in that same CG style, I think. I've heard good things about it, but I want to see the second movie first. And I've heard lots of bad things about that, so I haven't watched it yet. Oh, and the ending. <laughs> okay. I totally forgot until the very, very end that this entire anime was taking place in the 80s. And there's a there's kind of a reveal at the end, which I'm tempted to just spoil. It doesn't have anything to do with the plot of the show. So I'm going to go ahead and say what it is. But basically, one of the characters turns out to be a real-life person. A real-life, I suppose, in a way you could say historical figure. But it's a fictional version of them, I guess. Uh, basically, one of the characters turns out to be Steve Jobs. He invents the iPhone at the end of the show. Uh, it has nothing to do at all with the plot or anything that's going on. And it's just some Japanese guy. Uh, but he uses some kind of technology that, I don't know. I mean, the, the, again, the, the explanation for things was really dumb. It didn't make sense. But somehow it inspires him to create the iPhone. And even if you're watching the show and you're like, damn it, he spoiled it. If you're watching the show, you're going to forget about this by the time you get to the end. And it comes absolutely out of nowhere. You're just watching the show 
be itself and then randomly you cut to this guy on a stage saying i invented the iphone and talking about it for like five minutes in like a like a full presentation and everything wearing steve jobs clothing and everything it was so weird and had nothing to do with anything else so i can only assume that that somehow is going to come up in season two that maybe like the technology used to create iphones is going to have some kind of monster related thing to do with it i don't know but it was so weird. It was such a weird decision and definitely made me laugh uh, uh, when I don't think I was supposed to. One other thing that made me laugh unintentionally was there's a group of bullies that picks on the main kids. And again, the kids are in elementary school. And I was thinking these bullies were especially ridiculous because they're like maybe in their mid-20s or something and they're picking on elementary school kids. But then it turns out that they, they, they're talking about the main bully and it turns out he's 12 years old, but he looks like he's 25. So... That was an example of, of really weird character design that was, I don't know, com completely wrong for the character. Plus, he's supposed to be American, but they did the typical Japanese thing where, from the Japanese perspective, they don't give a shit about making it feel authentic. So there are scenes where other characters are like, oh, you know English, what, what does this say? And he's just like reading it all in Japanese and, and doesn't speak with an American accent at all, or it doesn't speak actual English. It was really funny. But yeah, overall, it was okay. It's definitely a step in the right direction compared to every other again, Godzilla, Gamera, or Ultraman-related thing that Netflix has put out in the past few years, because they've all sucked. And that's all I had time for this month. So what did you check out? I watched a movie from 2019 called Come to Daddy, <laughs> which is a horror comedy starring Elijah Wood, where he gets a note from his father, who he hasn't seen in years, asking him to come visit him. So he shows up, and his father is Stephen McCaddy, and it's on the beach, very isolated, and Stephen McCaddy is really funny because he's just this belligerent drunk. I usually think of Stephen McCaddy as playing this suave type guy. You know what I mean? I always imagine him as like a villain or a character with very questionable motives. Right, but just his mannerisms are very smooth. I suppose. He's definitely a, a confident type character or actor. Yeah, like he's always convincing other characters, and they usually buy it. Yeah, that's true. And it turns out, unsurprisingly, I'm going to drop some spoilers here, he's not actually his father. He's trying to trick him into thinking he's his father, because Elijah Wood, oh, his character's name is Norval, and he is so annoying. It's a perfect encapsulation of people who try and make their lives sound really, really interesting and have to one-up everybody. So at one point, they're sitting together, and he can't drink because he has an alcohol problem, but Steve McCaddy keeps trying to make him drink, and Elijah Wood's like, you know, I'm a big deal. I'm this huge record producer, and name drops all of these people, and one of them is Elton John. And Steve McCaddy's like, you know Elton John? And this is when Elijah Wood still thinks Steve McCaddy is his dad. And he's like, yeah, I know Elton John. We're like good friends. And Steve McKetty is like, shit, I know Elton John too. I was his limo driver for years. And Elijah Wood realizes the jig is up. And he's like, oh, that that's so great. What are the chances? And Steve McKetty's like, let's call him right now. How crazy is that? And Elijah Wood's like, no, no, uh, we, we don't need to call him. And it was just very satisfying to see one of these people who always makes up a bunch of shit about their life to seem really interesting just totally get called on their bullshit. So Stephen McCaddy goes through the whole process of picking up the phone and being like, I got his number. Yeah, like we're good friends. And eventually Elijah Wood's like, I don't know Elton John. And Stephen McCaddy's like, well, neither do I. But we have established <laughs> that you're full of shit. <laughs> it was great. So it turns out that he's not his dad, and his real dad is chained up in the basement, and they've been torturing him because together they stole a bunch of money. And Elijah Wood's real dad took all of the money. So then it turns into this thing of Elijah Wood trying to rescue his real dad, and them trying to escape Stephen McCaddy and the other people who stole the money. I ended up liking it, and the direction it took, I wasn't sure at the beginning if I would. See, for me, that's such a ridiculous title that that might make me click on it by itself. <laughs> I watched Frank and Weenie, but the original short film from 1984, because I know they made a CG remake. Or was it stop motion? Yeah, I'm not sure. I never saw it. I saw the original a long time ago, but I haven't seen the remake. This is an early Tim Burton thing where a kid's dog gets hit by a car and he's learning about, you know, electricity in school or whatever and eventually makes the whole Frankenstein set up to resurrect his dog and it's successful. What are your thoughts on this one? It's been too long. I remember liking it 
And it, I mean, it's clearly an homage to a lot of things that Tim Burton is a fan of. And of course, I love stop motion. Well, this one's live action. Oh, maybe I'm thinking of something else. Oh, I'm thinking of Vincent, I think. Was that something that he did? Yeah, yeah. That's stop motion. I like that one. That's the one that's narrated by Vincent Price. Okay. Uh, clearly, I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> Kids' parents are played by Shelley Duvall and Daniel Stern. That doesn't ring a bell? Yeah, see, Shelley Duvall definitely does. Either way, if I've seen it, it's been too long. But there's like a ton of homages to Frankenstein, obviously, and it was really well made. And it was still Disney, and I'm not sure how much Tim Burton did before this, but you know, it seems like they had a lot of faith in him to be like, yes, we, Disney, will let you, Tim Burton, make this short film. Yeah, and back then there would have been much less of an audience for short films. Like, it'd be harder to get them out. And after it was finished, Tim Burton was like, here you go. And Disney was like, oh, wait, no, this is no good. And they shelved it and fired him. And I don't think it was ever released officially until much later. And it might have been, I saw it as an extra on The Nightmare Before Christmas. I don't know if it ever got a standalone release. But then they remade it. Disney still, again, remade it in whatever that was, 2012. But I assume more family friendly. It was worth watching for sure. I watched Dark City from 1998, which you like, I remember. Yes. Uh, I've only seen the director's cut, so if you talk about the theatrical one, I don't even know what the differences are. Okay. This was the theatrical version. So this dude is in this city that is dark. <laughs> and every night, everybody falls asleep at the same time, no matter what they're doing, except him. And he finds it odd, so it's realistic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> And it turns out that he's not actually in a city on Earth. Aliens have created a city out in space and populated it with humans. And their end goal is to discover what they are lacking, which is like the human soul or something like that. It's basically just a big experiment. And none of the humans know that they're in space. And Kiefer Sutherland is a scientist, so it's not realistic. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> who is helping them. And they have these big syringes where they implant memories into people while they're sleeping. And then they wake up and go through that 12-hour period or 24-hour period as a different person. And they're just always being studied. So this dude figures all of it out. And it turns out that he has gained the ability of the aliens, and they call it tuning, to basically reshape reality. So then the aliens are freaked out that this dude isn't falling asleep and is onto their plan and can possibly destroy them. So they all go after him. And the aliens themselves look like people, but they have like really white skin and they're always dressed in black. And their actual form is this CG face hugger looking thing that lives inside the brain part. This movie gets a lot of Matrix nods whenever it's brought up because I suppose the basic plot is the same of a dude who realizes his world isn't real, but that is not unique to the Matrix either. Like you said, the Matrix is more realized than this one. And I think it's more relatable too because it involves computers and technology and this one is, oh yeah, there's aliens floating in a giant city in space. Yeah, I think the overall kind of style of them is also very different. Like this one is going for more of like a fantastical feel and the Matrix is more reality based. I totally agree. And as far as I know, this is a standalone movie, right? No sequel or anything like that? I can't remember if they tried to do something at some point. Oh, Jennifer Connelly's in this too, but already to the point where she was no longer interesting in movies. Yeah, but I remember her not being as bad in this movie as she is in a lot of other movies. Right. Well, she didn't really have a huge part. She basically showed up and was like, I'm your wife. And the guy was like, okay. Okay, I guess the director did a short film, apparently, that came out in 2021 that's set in the same universe. What is it called? Mask of the Evil Apparition. And according to Wikipedia, he said he is in the early stages of developing a Dark City series. You know, we are in 2024 where we just rehash things that came out 20, 30, 40 years ago. So I would not be surprised if, you know, it's like coming to HBO Max or whatever the hell they call it now. Dark City, the series. And to be honest, I would be okay with that. I mean, I, I, don't, I wouldn't really care one way or the other, but it's not something where I'd be angry that they were messing with it or something. As long as they get Bruce Spence again. Is that the guy from the from uh, the Mad Max movies? Yeah. Is he in that? I don't remember that. Yeah, he's one of the aliens. He's also in the second and third Matrix movie. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I thought it was ridiculous in The Road Warrior during the epilogue where there's that narration and they talk about what happened after Max leaves them and the narrator's like, the gyrocopter pilot became our new leader. I was like, that is bullshit. (laughs) He proved himself in battle and everything. Because he could fly a little helicopter? I guess. (laughs) As soon as someone shot a gun at him, he just crashed and almost died. No, they they used one of those things that fires out the four darts at the same time or whatever. Oh, sorry. (laughs) But his character spent the whole movie showing up to that base, seeing this young girl and being like, damn, I need to abduct her. No, he didn't. (laughs) Yes, he did. No, he didn't. (laughs) They tried to sneak away before the big fight. And she was like, I can't abandon everyone. And he's like, yeah, you can. Yeah, that's true. But that's not that's not abducting somebody. If I try to convince somebody, well, I mean, I guess it depends. But <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. I watched this movie from 1991. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It's either Zayram or Zaram. I'm not sure where the emphasis goes. Z-E-I-R-A-M. Oh, yes. It's Japanese. I'm trying to remember. It sounded really cool, but I don't remember details. It was cool. So as I was watching this, I thought this has to be a live action adaptation of an anime or a manga because there were so many shots that were so intentional and looked like they were framed exactly like you would see in a manga. But I was very surprised to find out that this was a completely original movie and in actuality, an OVA was created after it. The opening scene was so good. It was so compelling. And I thought, what is this movie? How have I not heard this before? This is going to be so awesome. But unfortunately, that aesthetic does not carry forward past the opening scene. If somebody made an entire movie like that opening part, it would be so good. It was very David Lynch-y in a good way. And it turns out the bulk of the movie is there is this woman who's an alien, but she looks like a human because we're in 1991. And she is a bounty hunter with her computer sidekick who is just in the room talking to her. And they're going after their latest bounty, which is, how do you say it? Uh, Zeram. Yeah. I'm just going to cut you saying that and paste it wherever I need it. So just so you know, that's why Robert's voice just pops in once in a while. And she's like, yeah, this is like routine. We'll get him. And they set up in an abandoned building and use the power from the building. And these two guys who work for the electric company see this surge of power where there shouldn't be. So they go to check it out and they find her all set up and they end up getting transported to what they call a zone, which is a trap she has set up for Zerum. So she has to go in after them because they've messed everything up of this trap for Zerum. It's very unique. It feels like a Power Rangers episode, but made with adults in mind. And there's something about this era of movies where sci-fi and action and anime all got mixed together. It's very unique feeling. And this movie gets likened to an alien ripoff, but it didn't feel like that to me at all. It felt much more like a Terminator ripoff because you have this unstoppable, non-speaking monster going after these people and they're throwing everything they can at it and there are explosions and guns and whatnot everywhere and it's not doing any damage. But instead of a robotic skeleton chasing them, Zerum is a Contra boss complete with a bunch of disgusting forms. The effects, again, felt like a Power Ranger. Or what's the Japanese version of that? Super Sentai? Yeah. Yeah, it felt like an episode of that, but again, for adults. The effects were good. And again, by the end, that thing was just so disgusting. And its main form kind of looks like a samurai, I guess, with like the big hat, you know, the big flat hat. And on the front of it is this tiny little face. And I guess that's its brain unit. And that thing shoots out once in a while. And it's attached to this long tendril, whatever. And it just bites into people's bodies and sucks out their DNA. It was gross, but so interesting. It sounds a lot like Dark Angel, a.k.a. I Come in Peace, which I talked about a ways back with Dolph Lundgren with an alien cop hunting an evil alien that sucks out people's whatever, with something in his in his wrist, I think, that shoots out. So, I don't know. I wonder if it was influenced by that, because it came out in 1990. And as I was watching this, I was like, man, this feels just like that Hakider movie that I saw however many months ago that was. And it turns out it was the same director. So I looked up this dude, and he's done some Kamen Rider movies from the 90s. He did the Ultraman vs. Kamen Rider TV movie. Have you seen that? That sounds like something you would have watched. I have not. I didn't even know that was a thing. I'm trying to start from the early stuff. Okay, well, that was 1993. It'll take me 25 years to get there. 
and he also did character designs for video games, a couple of the Onimushas, so demon type stuff, which makes sense. So I watched the sequel, which came out in 1994, huge loss of budget, and something that really hurt the movie was everything looked much cleaner and well lit. It made it look much more like a Super Sentai episode. Even the fighting felt much more scripted. Like the first one had goofy fights, but they felt improvised, like two people were actually trying to defeat one another, as opposed to moving through fight choreography. And Zerum. And the second one is now a robot, which did not help. The grossness of him being this dripping organic monster was a much better choice. And it fit better with the face thing. I am surprised they got all three of the main cast members from the first one to come back in this one. Because this felt like the type of movie where it would be just on TV and they would replace two out of three people with different actors who just wouldn't be as good. But they got the three main people. And they also threw in this fourth guy who is just comic relief and another bounty hunter. He's really inept. He laughs a lot. And I could not stop seeing him as John Luizamo if he were Japanese. It was uncanny. <laughs> But yeah, the whole plot just felt like they weren't really sure what to do, but they just wanted to make another movie, so they did. I watched a movie from 1972, which turned out to be Christopher Walken's first movie ever. And the title I watched it under was The Mind Snatchers. But I found out it was also released under The Happiness Cage and The Demon Within. <laughs> wow, those are all very different titles. Yeah. So Christopher Walken is a schizophrenic sociopath. So they figured, well, we should put him in this movie then. <laughs> <laughs> See, sometimes the old jokes are the best, because they make that joke every time. Yeah, I was going to say, I knew you were going to say something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we got so many viewers. Thanks, three people. And he's in the army, and I think he's in Germany. And the whole opening sequence made this movie feel like it was going to be really, really bad. Because the editing had these weird cuts, and the acting wasn't very good. And I wasn't sure what to expect from Christopher Walken at first. He seems like most of the characters he would play later, just his goofiness. But everyone around him is 100% straight. So it doesn't really work. And the other characters react to him like he's also playing everything very straight. So he'll say something really weird and in a quirky way, and they'll be like, yes, I see. It doesn't mesh. Eventually, the MPs come, and they detain him, and he gets thrown into this hospital. But the only patients are him, some guy in a bed who just yells a lot. He doesn't actually talk. And Ronnie Cox. And I'm not sure how early this was in Ronnie Cox's career, but he's very young, too. Well, actually, Christopher Walken doesn't look very young. He looks like he always looks. And this being his first movie, hang on, I'm going to look up how old he is. So he was born in 1943. So in 1972, he would have been 29. Yeah. But he looks the way he always looks. If you want to see Ronnie Cox and Christopher Walken get into a tickle fight, then you should watch <laughs> this movie. Sold. Their doctor is played by Joss Ackland. Is that how you say that? Yeah, it looks like it's probably short for Jocelyn. And his goal is to take negative emotions and feelings and whatever and adjust your brain so you don't feel that and you're able to be controlled. And his way to do that in this movie, because it's so low budget, is to tie piano wire around parts of your brain and have it stick out the top of your head and deliver electric shocks to that thing, which will travel to that part of your brain and make you behave. And as the movie went on, it actually got more compelling because there was surprisingly character development. There was this subplot of Ronnie Cox and his past and this nurse that comes in once in a while to play checkers with him. And that part felt the most real out of the whole thing. And that nurse was a really good actor and that whole subplot between the two of them made me feel very uncomfortable, but also really respect this movie a lot more. But you're not going to talk about who the actress was? I don't know her name. Looks like a lot of theater stuff. So nothing important. <laughs> <laughs> when you get cast by James Gunn, come talk to me. <laughs> and I don't know, maybe The Happiness Cage was a play to begin with? I'm not sure. It's hard to find stuff about this. Mostly all of the posters put Christopher Walken's face on it now because, you know, he became big. I watched Suspect Zero from 2004, which is a terrible movie. Harvey Dent is an FBI agent who has been disgraced because there was this serial killer and he was so fed up that he basically beat the shit out of him. He might have murdered him too. 
And so he was disgraced and, you know, sent out to the middle of nowhere and a bunch of murders start happening out there. So they're like, okay, well, you kind of know what you're doing. So why don't you help out? And his ex-wife, who's played by Carrie Ann Moss, comes out to help him. And she doesn't want to be there because she's his ex and they just have to get through it together. And it turns out that this new serial killer is killing other serial killers. And I was like, okay, we'll see where this goes. And it went in a direction I did not expect. So Ben Kingsley is the new serial killer. And every time he kills somebody or goes through the whole thing and we see it, it always ends with Harvey Dent waking up at his desk. And he's like, oh, oh man, like what's going on? And I was thinking, oh man, is it going to be something dumb where it turns out he imagines himself as Ben Kingsley killing these people and then wakes up and says like, oh, I don't remember where I was yesterday. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So basically having two personalities, <laughs> which I would have rolled my eyes at. But it turns out it was something completely different. It turns out that he and a bunch of other people are psychic and have like mental flashes of what each other is doing. It was really weird. It didn't make any sense. It felt really thrown in because the rest of the movie was like a straight serial killer movie. And it was not good. It was not a good movie. And Carrie Ann Moss, I think this was her first thing after the Matrix trilogy. So go do Silent Hill 2. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also a terrible movie. I remember liking it, but it's been so long. Oh, man. I knew you were going to say something like that. <laughs> I remember it's stupid that she fights Pyramid Head at the end. I remember that was really dumb. But I don't actually remember anything else about it. I remember that movie being incredibly forced. It felt like a cutscene out of a video game. Like the main girl. She's like, oh, I found this thing on the ground. And she picks it up and you practically hear like the sound effect go... <laughs> and somebody looks at her and goes, that looks like it could unlock a door. Okay, I'll try to watch it again. I'll, I'll, I'll do my review at some point. I watched Modern Times from 1936, which is a Charlie Chaplin movie. It was, was it the last one where he played the tramp? I don't know. It was late. So he's this dude who works in a factory. And this movie was like watching a live action cartoon in a good way. So all of the promotional pictures for this and the things people remember are typically when he's working at this giant machine, like putting a nuts on bolts or something on an assembly line and eventually gets sucked into the machine and he's going around all the gears and stuff. And it's really impressive. And there's like one part where this inventor comes in to the owner of this factory and he's like, hey, we have this new invention that means workers don't ever have to take a break anymore because it like feeds them lunch as they're standing at the assembly line. So they hook it up around Charlie Chaplin and it, you know, just keeps smashing food into his face and stuff. And I was laughing because it was funny. But then there's this subtext of workers being treated unfairly and revolting and fighting for better working conditions and stuff. So he meets this girl who is played by his then wife in real life, I'm pretty sure. And they end up getting together and they're trying to make it together. You know, and she's stealing and he goes to jail and then it turns out he really likes it in jail. And there's this really weird sequence. Someone is smuggling cocaine and they sit down to lunch and the person puts it in the salt shaker and the Charlie Chaplin dumps it all over his food, not realizing it's cocaine. And there's this whole sequence where he's just totally tripping. And it was really funny. Through circumstance, he gets released and he's like, no, I actually kind of want to stay here. So he keeps trying to get himself thrown back into jail. It was good. It was a really good movie. And it was made at the time when sound movies were able to be made, but he intentionally still made it silent. There's like a little bit of talking by other characters, I guess just to show that it's possible. But he intentionally said, I don't want my character to talk. I don't want the tramp to talk, which was a really good decision because that character worked so well as a silent movie character. There is a sequence at the end where he's working in a restaurant and they lie and say he's also an entertainer. So that's why he gets hired at the restaurant. So the owner puts him out and says, okay, it's time for you to perform, to sing. And Charlie Chaplin does sing this song, but he does it in all nonsense syllables, which is like a perfect fit for getting that character to make sound, but not actually talk. And it was shot at 18 frames per second, which was the silent movie, you know, FPS but it was projected at the sound movie rate, which is 24 frames per second. So it makes everything, give it, it gives it that silent movie, everything's moving a little bit faster look. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that works to the movie's benefit. Definitely worth watching though, especially if you like cocaine. <laughs> I watched The Protector from 2005, which is the Tony Ja movie, not the Jackie Chan one from the 70s. I was just thinking about that movie the other day. Which one? The Tony Ja one. 
So this is after Ong Bak, which was the one where people started paying attention to Tony Jaa. And this is the one where he has an elephant, and his elephant is taken away. Yeah, the original John Wick storyline. <laughs> I'm just imagining Keanu Reeves being like, Do you know where my elephant is? <laughs> so Tony Jaa goes through all of Thailand looking for his elephant, beating the shit out of anybody who gets in his way. And, you know, back when he was doing movies like this, you know, he did all the fight choreography himself, and the hits are just so solid they're so satisfying and they feel so legit like you know jackie chan does his own fight choreography too but they feel like jackie chan fights like they're not bad they're also really good and you know he uses like props and stuff yeah they're more more stylized i would say in a way yeah stylized that's the word i was looking for tony jaw's fights feel much more impactful when you get hit you're going down mm -hmm. not we're gonna have a big styly fight where i you know run down a building and do this cool stunt where i ride a motorcycle off of a train or something I'm saying it like it's bad, but that's also like awesome. Like Jackie Chan, stuff like that is so cool. Yeah, like Jackie Chan movies are more for the, the sheer entertainment. And I think the Tony Jaa ones are more about the brutality of the fight. Yeah, I truly respect his stunt team. I remember watching this movie back in the day and we did a drinking game where any time any character was standing in front of a door, we would take a shot because every time <laughs> Tony Jaa would run at that person and they would go blasting through that door. So, you know, you'd see a guy and he'd be like, what are you doing here? And he'd kind of slowly walk while he was talking and the door would come into frame and everyone would be like, oh shit. <laughs> The one downside, I think, to the movies like this that he made is while he gets people who can really fight, he can't get people who can also act. And in this one particularly, there's one scene in a temple where it is a video game. There's this bad guy who can fight. And so he fights him and he beats him. And then immediately, like that guy just like disappears and then another guy shows up and he's like, now you got to fight me. And so he does that fight and then that guy just disappears. And then this huge Hulk and dude comes in. He's like, now you got to fight me. And it was like stages of Mortal Kombat. And the last big fight was really funny because I had captions on at that point. And that last fight is when everyone's bones are being broken. And the captions read, bones cracking, henchman 14 yells. <laughs> and then... A second later, bones cracking, henchman 15 yells. And it just goes through that for like the entire <laughs> fight, which is really funny. And they did a second one. Did you ever watch the second one? I think so. Is it still the elephant? I don't know. I wouldn't remember, but I, I think I did watch it. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if I skipped to the fight scenes because the movies where he's in charge, where like the movies that are really his movies and not just a movie that he's in, it's not just that the actors are bad. The way the movie is set up tends to be really bad outside of the fight scenes. And I, I find them mostly really boring outside of the fight scenes. And I think that's a plus for Jackie Chan because he does the fight choreography, but he's like, I know there are other people who can do other elements of this movie better than me and I'm going to let them do it. Yeah, see, that's what I was thinking about when I was thinking about this movie. I was in my head, like, comparing it to Jackie Chan and thinking Jackie Chan movies are still good outside of the fight scenes. They're still entertaining. The fights are just part of the entertainment. It all, it kind of almost all works together. Whereas Tony Jaa movies, everything in between is just an excuse to get to the next fight scene. Right. And I watched American Dragons from 1998. Who's in it? This is Michael Bean and Park Jun hoon Is that how you say it? No idea. Sounds Korean. It is Korean, and I apologize for totally butchering that. So I want you to imagine this movie where, in a big American city, there's a detective, and he's used to working alone, but an outside Asian influence comes in and is stirring things up. So he's kind of at a loss. So in response, an Asian detective is sent to partner up with him. And they're both very sarcastic. But this is not rush hour. So there's the Italian mafia and there's the Yakuza. And Michael Bean is trying to just keep things from exploding. And the South Korean group called the Black Lotus Society comes in and wants to take over everything. So what they do is they trick the Yakuza and the mob into thinking they've started attacking each other to start this war. And once everyone's dead, they'll just come in and clean up and take over. So Michael Bean and his new partner, who he doesn't want... There's a lot of scenes that feel very generic where, well, also like Rush Hour, Jackie Chan is like, hey, I'm here to help out. And Chris Tucker is like, you know, I don't even know why you're here. I'm sorry, I can't make my voice go that high. So just imagine. <laughs> so Chris Tucker says, you know, you need to fill me in on what's going on here. And Jackie Chan's like, you wouldn't understand. Like that's a beat for beat for this movie. 
See, that again sounds like that Dolph Lundgren movie, and it sounds like a lot of movies like that from that time period, from the 90s. I think you just want to try and tie everything back to that Dolph Lundgren movie and be like, this movie's way better than people realize. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so the movie moves forward. There's, like, fights and people getting beat up, and Michael Bean, a lot of him just being like, God, fuck, and then just having to <laughs> deal with whatever. And there's this really weird montage right in the middle where the two of them to blow off some steam and they're starting to get along with each other. They go to this underground boxing gym and they have this full Rocky montage of working out complete with pump up music and everything. It was so weird. And you think, okay, I, I guess now they're on the same page and they're going to start getting the upper hand. But as soon as they walk out, they almost get hit by a car. There's a drive-by shooting where they almost get killed. And then they go to get in Michael Bean's car and it blows up because there's a car bomb on it. So this whole big positive montage is immediately thrown in the gutter because they're still where they were before the big positive montage. And I don't know if that was intended to be funny. I mean, the whole montage was weird. Like somebody saw Rocky, you know, 20 years after Rocky came out and said, what if we just did that? And they said, yeah, but neither of these guys box. And this isn't that type of movie. And they said, I don't care. And the end fight was pretty good too. So the Italian guy and Michael Bean are fighting and Michael Bean grabs the only gun. So he's got the advantage, right? But then the mafia guy pulls out a grenade and pulls a pin and he's holding on to it. So they're at a stalemate. And he's like, if you shoot me, this whole thing's going to blow up and we're going to die. But then Park shows up with the Black Lotus assassin and Michael Bean shoves the mafia guy back. And to prevent him from throwing the live grenade, they both just keep shooting at him repeatedly like you would do in a PS1 video game to stagger the bad guy from attacking. <laughs> you know, just get him trapped in that animation. Yeah, that sounds funny. And they both fire like 60 shots into this guy. And it's all in slow motion. And it goes on for a full minute. And it wasn't supposed to be funny. It was supposed to be cool. As you could tell by the music, which sounded like the American dub music from the Toonami airing of Dragon Ball Z. And eventually the guy staggers back over a wall with the South Korean assassin. And the grenade blows up. It was really funny. But not supposed to be funny. And then they go and make Rush Hour 2. And that's all I watched. I read... Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein. And you've read this, I'm sure. I have not, actually. I like Heinlein a lot, but I have not read that one. Because it's too long? You only like short stories? No, I just haven't gotten to it. Okay. Well, it is a novel. <laughs> I read novels. <laughs> I talked about reading freaking It. That's like a billion pages. Yeah, you probably read the novelization of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Where they just kept referring to it as Tim Curry. <laughs> so Stranger in a Strange Land is kind of split into three parts. So there's this man from Mars. And he is human. And he was born on Mars because there was a mission that went out there. So he was pretty much raised by Martians in the Martian way. And he comes back to Earth. And due to the politics and bureaucracy of everything, he technically owns the planet Mars by Earth standards. So there's a lot of people trying to gain influence and take advantage of him. And he is the definition of naive because he's never been on Earth. So he's very impressionable. And they're trying to figure him out too. And of course, he has more money than anyone has ever had in the history of anything because of the way everything was set up. It was interesting. So the first part of the book is really how the world reacts to him because everyone wants to interview him, but the government wants to keep him in this hospital. And one of his nurses kind of feels bad for him and wants to find out more. And she is friends with the journalist. And he's like, you've got to get in there. And they're pretty much the main characters. And she eventually gets him out. And the second part is how he reacts and learns about the world once he's on his own. So he ends up at this dude's house, which is very secluded, and this guy's famous, so he is able to keep everybody away, because he's also like a really good lawyer, so it was a good setting. And he's very smart. He's basically Heinlein expositing all his philosophical beliefs and stuff about the world and the nature of things. And the third part of the book is when the man from Mars leaves and goes off on his own, and how he starts to change the world around him, and how he influences other people. Because, again, he's just this huge influential figure and everyone wants to talk to him and be a part of his life. And it was a good book. It explores a lot of philosophy and religion and just the nature of humanity and things like that. It felt very mature for Heinlein. Like, I've read a good chunk of his short stories and stuff. And this felt like he said, yes, I have this long form story I want to tell. And he did it very well. I also read Fahrenheit 451, which I first read back in high school. But, you know, in high school, you're inherently stupid. 
and you don't always fully appreciate, you know, the stuff you read. Or, you know, sometimes you're like, I don't care. Like, I just want to get through this class. Yeah, I think I also have not read that since high school, so... So I went back to read it. I was surprised at how short it was. Like, I remembered it being a lot longer, but that's probably because I was in high school and I just wanted to get done with that class. And it was even more misleading because I only got halfway through the pages of the book and it was like the end. And I was like, oh shit, but there's like half of this book left. And it turns out in the version I bought, it's a bunch of essays about Fahrenheit 451, some by Bradbury himself. So if you don't know the story of Fahrenheit 451... It's set in the future, and independent thought is pretty much outlawed, and reading is a huge part of that, because the thought process is, if people read, then they'll have different opinions and different thoughts, and if they have different thoughts, it will cause conflict, and conflict will cause violence and anger and war, so let's just eliminate all of that. So you're not allowed to read, and everyone's really dumb and just does what they're told, and they have TVs that are the size of their entire walls, and they just sit and watch really dumb shows. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And the main character is a fireman, but in the future, firemen start fires. They don't put them out. So his job is basically to go find people who have books and set their house on fire. He eventually takes a book out of curiosity and like hides it and starts reading and realizes things are kind of shitty in the world they live in. And it's his slow self-realization that things could be better. But then he becomes a criminal because of that, and he's on the run. And really, right when the story kind of picked up, I was like, okay, so what's going to happen? And then it was like, the end. And it was good. A message that is not locked to the year the book was written or the things that influenced the book. I played a puzzle game called Baba Is You. It is so good. Okay, so I'll try and describe it as best I can. It is a language-based game. So there are words on this 2D plane and you are a character and you kind of move around and you can push the words on this grid and there's objects and stuff like that. And you can connect words into sentences. So you have like a subject, a verb, and a state. And if those three things are connected, then it makes that statement true. And it's very explicit. If that sentence is disconnected, then that statement is no longer true. So for instance, you'll have the subject wall and you'll have the verb is and you'll have the state, it'll be the word stop. So if the sentence is wall is stop, then your character cannot go through any walls. But if you break one of those words out, so the sentence is no longer complete, then as far as the game is concerned, the walls do not exist anymore. So you can just walk through them. Sounds interesting. It is, it's really interesting. And you have all of these rules that are set up. You'll have all these words all over the stage and these verbs and these states. And you can keep pushing things around to get things to happen the way you want them to happen. And at the beginning, it's such a mind twist thing because you see the stage, you see all the objects on the stage and you say, okay, so I can't go through the walls or whatever. But it's like you can because there's nothing that says you can't. And your character itself, like one of the states is you. So the game is called Baba is you. So, you know, sometimes there are multiple ways to complete a stage. So in order to complete the stage, you usually have to reach whatever the thing is that you say is win. So it'll be like flag is win. And that makes the flag object the thing you have to get to. But what you are could also be variable. So it could be Baba is you, or it could be wall is you, or it could be flag is you. And you can adjust all of that crap around in order to beat each stage. And they get really, really difficult. And you're not really locked into doing it linearly. You can kind of bounce around. Like if one is too hard, you can just kind of go somewhere else and do another one. But I really, really enjoyed this game. I would recommend it if you want something a little more cerebral. Yeah, it definitely sounds interesting. I played Star Fox, the first one from 93 for Super Nintendo. And I checked something off my bucket list, which was finally play Star Fox on the hard path and do it successfully. Star Fox is a rail shooter made for Super Nintendo with 3D polygons using that Super FX chip. It was a huge innovation at the time. It was actually developed mostly by a non-Japanese studio, but they impressed Nintendo so much that Nintendo was like, okay, go ahead and make this game. And that was at the time also when Nintendo was very like kind of clamped down on who was allowed to do what. Some of the stages in the hard path are so good and so unique and it's just so well designed. But because so much is happening the frame rate just drops so low on those stages. So I'm sure there's some patches out there where it keeps everything at like 30 or 60 or whatever. And I might check something like that out. That would be cool. And I followed that up with Star Fox 2, which was actually done back in 
the mid 90s, but they never released it. It was also Super Nintendo and it wasn't officially released until 2017 and it was on the Super Nintendo Mini and I think they released it on Nintendo Switch Online as well. And it's the same concept, but because the monumental work of making the game actually function is done, the game feels much more put together. It has such a cinematic feel to it. There's real intention with the way the camera works because again, they're like, we figured out how the game works. Now we can focus on making it feel really cool. It really feels like a movie more than a game. And even the style, it's not linear anymore. You have a full map where you can kind of choose where you want to go next. And there's things happening like ships are moving towards bases. The developers really had a good handle on how everything worked. So they could focus so much more on the presentation and the presentation is so good. The game itself is not as difficult as the first one, which I'm not really complaining about. It's still a good game. And I think it's just cool that they decided to officially release it, you know, 20 years after it was actually done. Yeah, so why didn't they release it back in the day? Nintendo was concerned that the 16-bit Star Fox 2 3D visuals would be compared to the superior 3D capabilities of competing consoles, because you would have PlayStation and Saturn coming out around then too. Hmm. So they decided to prioritize the 64 and push a lot of the ideas to Star Fox 64. And that's all I did this month. So I should have more stuff to talk about next month. Now that I have gotten things figured out a lot more here in Japan, now that I got a VPN so I can watch Tubi again and stuff, and I might even hopefully have at least one book to talk about next month, but we'll see. And I think by August, I should be back in the U.S. So if my audio sounds really shitty, it'll get better in August. Too bad we can't do anything about the quality of the stuff you watch. <laughs> 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 says the guy that like every movie is like this is the dumbest movie i've ever seen and whatever <laughs> yeah but you're on the other side going everything about this movie was terrible but it wasn't bad <laughs> <sighs> no comments whatever <laughs> <laughs> thanks for watching